everybody, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And my guest today is an entrepreneur who had a successful career in real estate development until the recession hit home in 2011. And he and his wife decided it was time for a new plan. And he turned his attention to the burgeoning cannabis industry. And in 2012, he formed a financial technology company providing software solutions to businesses with the cannabis industry. David Dinenberg is a CEO and founder of Kind Financial. Thanks so much for being with us today, David. Hi, Montel. How are you? It's a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, my goodness. Good, sir. Really, really, really good to have you today. And I should make sure I make sure I make a little bit of a disclosure saying that I'm an advisory board member to Kind Financial. And I've known David since really right before 2016. It's been a while, my friend. It's been fun. It's been interesting. Roller coaster. But, you know, the way you look at the industry and, and when we first met, just your passion for it and, and the health the healthcare part of it always interests me. And I, I, I've always respected your opinion. Thank you so much, sir. Honestly, I respect yours too. Now, you know, let's back up and try to explain to everybody what exactly is what you do. I know kind, kind pay is behind you and kind financial is what you created. But let's back up and talk about how you went from managing a $400 million plus real estate portfolio to getting involved in a startup in cannabis. That's a great question. You know, back in 2007 and 2008, when the recession hit and the real estate collapse happened, um, you know, we were fighting every day at the, at, back at the office in Philadelphia of just staying alive. And, you know, you have the professional side of it and then you have the personal side of it. And, you know, professionally, the company survived and it's doing very well still today. I left in 2012, as you said. Uh, but on, on the personal side, we, we, we really got hit hard. Our, our house was in foreclosure. Um, we needed to make a change. My partner back in Philadelphia in the real estate world and I decided to separate and just do different things. And I was trying to find what was next for David Dinenberg and, and, and the family. And I just happened to see a 60 Minutes episode in October of 2012 that talked about the emergence of medicinal marijuana. At that point, it was you know less than 16 states and a billion dollars in revenue combined. And I only heard 10 seconds, Montel, which was no banking, no credit cards, no financial structure. And it really just, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how states were legalizing something that is federally illegal. And in my personal opinion, they just weren't having a complete thought around legalization. You're creating an industry, you're creating products, you're creating demand for a product. And the way we operate, even today, you know, six, seven years later, it's still a cash intensive business. Banking is very difficult. Uh, the ambiguity between the federal law and the state laws just cause all these different issues, you know, 280E with taxes, uh, research and healthcare. We have all these different issues, but we were looking for the next thing. And I just saw this great opportunity in cannabis. And, and but what made you decide that, okay, there's a great opportunity in cannabis, but let me see if I can hit it from a different perspective. I'm going to hit it from the financial services perspective. What made you think about that? It was really, I didn't understand how these governments, state governments, were creating, a, by legalizing medicinal cannabis, they were creating an industry that hasn't existed in 100 years. And every business, whether you're selling widgets or cannabis or cars, you need to be able to put your money in a bank and, and write a check and pay your bills and accept payments and just really conduct business like any other industry in the world. And that's become our company motto and passion, which is all we want for cannabis industry is for it to come out of the gray, come mainstream, and honestly, just be able to conduct your everyday business like any other industry in the world. That was, that was the opportunity that I saw. Okay, but what blows my mind is that, like you said, still till today, all over the country, there are cannabis companies that have to take their cash and find some vault somewhere to put it in, hire some third party, you know, company to move their cash from their dispensary to where their vault is and hire guards to sit in front of their vault at night. And they have to pay their bills with cash. They have to pay their taxes with cash. They have to pay their employees with cash. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever that we still have a government that tries to enjoy the benefits of the tax dollars out of this, but won't make it even easier for them to collect it. A hundred percent on that. Plus we live in COVID now. So we live in, we have a public health issue with going into a dispensary and handing cash 
to, to the salesperson. I mean, how do you get six feet away from somebody if you have to send them, if you have to hand them cash? Delivery in cannabis industry since March is up 400%. Curbside pickup never existed before COVID. Today, we need to find a way, and, and we're going to talk about it shortly, I'm sure, but we've worked literally since the ascension of kind to solve this problem. And we're, we're really excited to start talking about the solution we have now. Well, you know, I'm, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that solution and be a part of helping you uh, roll that part out uh, across the country. I think you pick any one state and you could literally, you know, the rules and regulations for things like, um, uh, not full banks, but um, credit unions, credit unions. Could you not establish some form of a cannabis credit union in each state? So I, I've had hundreds of these conversations over the years. And, you know, as you said earlier, I'm an ex-real estate developer, right? I'm not a banker. I've never claimed to be a banker. But I've done so much research and talked to so many smart people who specialize in banking and money movement and all these different things. I, let's, let's start at the top of this. Banking cannabis is a risk tolerance. You know, FinCEN, Division of the Treasury Department in 2014, set out a memo to financial institutions saying, if you guys want to take that leap of faith and bank cannabis, here's how you should be doing it. Now, law has never changed. All we have, all the financial institutions have still to this day, by the way, is guidance. And I think I, think I saw a number a couple of weeks ago that it actually has decreased uh, recently, banking the banks uh, touching the space, and that number is below 700 banks now. So, and most of those banks, to your point, Montel, are smaller banks. Here's the reality, in my personal opinion, in cannabis banking: you're not going to get the big guys to come into the space until the federal law actually changes, because fundamentally, in order to adhere to the FinCEN guidelines, the bank. And, and the cannabis licensee, the cannabis business, they need to have a more intimate relationship than the guy down the street selling paper clips, right? Not only do they have to understand the licensee's business, on the retail side, on the dispensary side, they also have to make sure that their customer, the dispensary, their customer, meaning you or me who's coming in to buy our medicine or to buy our recreational cannabis, we have to be adhering to that state law as well, right? So if it's medicinal, making sure you have your recommendation and you're not buying more than you're allowed to buy. If it's recreational, making sure you're over 21. Because what happens is if the dispensary's customer is not a true cannabis customer, then that, that dispensary is violating state law and that puts the banking relationship in jeopardy. And these are the little nuances that most people don't understand. But back to what you said earlier, could, you, could a credit union just start and cater to cannabis? You know, there hasn't been a new federal chartered bank issued in the last 15 years. And any charter, any new bank starting out, when they get underwritten and looked at by their regulators, whether it's a federal regulator or a state regulator, no, no one business, no one financial institution can be too far into one industry. They, they want to see the offset of risk. So starting a bank, yes, I think we've, we've seen a few banks try to do it and try to start, but I've spent so much time trying to understand and, and, and kind as a company trying to understand because we do many different things in technology. We, we, we do a seed to sale package, which, you know, we know where all the plants are. We know where all the, you know, inventory, the, the transactions, the tax that's due, you know, when you have that linear line of data, what can we do with that, right? So we've shown that to banks and say, listen, we can help mitigate your risk. We can help offset that perceived additional risk in the cannabis industry. And it's just impossible or very difficult to find that bank willing to step, to put their toes into the water and roll their sleeves up and do what's right. But, to, but that is why cannabis banking to me is a localized uh, relationship. Bank of America they do all of their anti-money laundering, Chase, Wells, all the big guys. They do it automated, right? Everything's automated. And when these large banks have anti-money laundering issues, you read about it in the newspaper saying, you know, the fine's a billion dollars because the fines are so large because they don't know they have a problem until it's too late. 
banking cannabis can't be that way. Okay, you have to have that personal relationship. So yes, automation is important for the banks, but having that relationship on an individual basis with their banking customers is also very important. But it seems like to me, and it would behoove, you know, dispensaries that are out there right now to try to do business a little different. I mean, if I'm a dispensary owner, I would guarantee and take our customers through the second and third degree to let them know, yes, you can purchase here, but we're going to take you through every one of the steps that's required by our state law. If I'm adhering to state law, then I don't understand why I can't take my money down to, you know, I don't know, David and Montel's vault, David and Montel vault, and put our money in there where we've got 10 Navy SEALs who are paid to stand outside 24 hours a day and guard that money that's in that, that vault. And when they want access to it, they come in, they sign for it, we give it to them, they take it out, we help them take it home, we come back. What's I, I don't understand why that can't be done, especially if everybody in the chain is adhering to the law. Right. I mean, the short answer is you can do that. Uh, but the second federal law changes, you're out of business. So I don't think many entrepreneurs are, are going to want to take that financial risk of starting a company, starting a business and providing services that will be wiped out most likely when federal law changes and banking comes into full force. Whether that's six months, one year or 20 years, we don't know that answer. Uh, but trying to answer your question, I see that as a risk tolerance move. You know, I, I think and what I've what our company has spent our time doing is trying to find experienced banks that have dealt in cannabis, whether that's you know a couple clients or a lot of clients, and really try to work together by providing technology layered with that banking sophistication and bringing that package to market. I, I think that is really the right answer. The, the, the answer is A, pass the Safe Banking Act Congress, or, or B, is entrepreneurs like ourselves spend the time, energy, and effort in trying to build these relationships that we can help the market stabilize. I mean, look at you. You're a sophisticated, popular, well-known individual. And you called me, what, about nine months ago for help with a bank account because you were having issues. And, you know, fortunately enough, I was able to help you. But even people like yourselves who, you know, everyone knows you're doing the right thing. Everyone knows you want to do everything as, as upfront and transparent as possible, but you know, you were having your own personal problems, professional problems, sorry. Correct. Yeah. But now, I mean, so let's, let's talk about kind, let's break kind down to what kind is. So kind has, you know, a system that's uh, really built around um, tr seed to seed to patient, right? Which is your Agrisoft. Let's talk a little bit about Agrisoft. So we originally purchased uh, Agrisoft, which, is a, which was a company in technology back in 2015. Why did we do that? Uh, the honest answer is at that time period, doing all the research we've all done and understanding data movement and, and compliance, it all comes down to compliance. And our thought process was if we had a product, a point of sale, that we knew the inventory, we knew the customer's customer, we knew the dispensary was selling to the right people. We understood they were collecting the correct amount of sales tax and paying their sales tax. We felt like if we had that component, we could really make inroads with banking. It's really where the original thought process came. Um, it was all a play to take it to the next level. It was always, we all, the company was formed and founded and, and launched honestly, to get the cash out of the stores, reduce public safety issues of operating a store all cash, right? To your point, security guards, cameras. I mean, the intensity of security in, in, in dispensaries is outlandish. Um, so C to sales our foundation, yes. And then what we've done is we had a banking company called Link to Banking, which where we use ex-federal regulators and ex-bankers in creating a way to uh, package data that banks could use to offset risk to entice them to to bank into the cannabis space. Um, but if you fast forward, we're sitting here in 2020. We launched in 2014, so six years of kind being around, um, we have finally gotten to a place where we officially partnered with a U.S.-based bank who's been banking cannabis for five years. They have several hundred 
MRBs, which are marijuana related businesses. So they're very comfortable with the necessary SAR reporting, compliance, transparency, working with their customer, working with their customer's customer. And I'm incredibly excited to tell you right now that KindPay will be in the market in late August. And, and this is something that we've been working on for six years. And as much as it's a technology, it's also the fact that we've partnered with a bank and we're bringing banking solutions to the industry now, which includes any merchant, any dispensary that participates in the kind pay payment system is going to be receiving a true, real FDIC transparent bank account that they will be able to fi finally operate normally. And these are the things that will take cannabis, in my personal opinion, take this industry to the next level. So not only are we going to be taking cash out of the ecosystem, not only are we going to be providing true banking to our bank partner, but KindPay, you'll be able to download KindPay at the uh, Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, and you open it up. It, it, it works just like your Starbucks, like you're buying coffee, Montel. You open up the app, you register as a customer of KindPay, you enter some information, and then here's the most beautiful part that no one can say to you with a straight face in this industry ever yet is you'll be able to use your Visa, MasterCard, or Discover in addition to your debit card if you choose and add value to the kind pay ecosystem. So we're finally, the industry is finally going to have a legal way to have a credit card purchase technically, right? And get the cash out of the store. It's going to help on the public safety issue and I believe reduce, reduce operational costs at the dispensary level potentially increase sales at the dispensary level because we've all been buying with cash. Maybe you spend a little bit more with credit. And in addition to that, now with COVID, we have a public safety issue. You'll be able to have your contactless payments, your social distancing payments. You could, you'll be able to order your cannabis or your medical cannabis from your local dispensary mm -hmm. online and then go for your curbside checkout and pickup all at one time. It's really the right time for kind pay. It's taken us six years to get here, but I do believe the market is ready for this and the environment of which we're going to be introducing this brand new product, it's the right time for a lot of reasons. Now, you, can you do this, introduce this across state lines? Yes, this is going to be, we're not restricted by state lines. This is going to be a national rollout of kind pay. Uh, we're also talking to government agencies because to your point earlier, collecting taxes is usually a cash business for government too. So we're going to try to, you know, work with local and state governments and try to provide easier ways for not in-person payments and not cash payments anymore. Um, these are all fundamental issues that any, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing that you and I are sitting here talking about how exciting this potentially could be in the marketplace when this is done every day in every other industry in the world. And it's all about, in our opinion, in Kind's opinion, is normalizing this industry. No, so when a person signs on for the app, they will have to, is that they will have to preload money into the app so that they have access to it later? How, do, how does that work? Yeah, they can, they, you, you, once you download the app, you'll be able to add value to the kind pay ecosystem, um, whether you're sitting in your couch or whether you're actually physically standing in a dispensary, yes. Um, and you'll be able to add that value, like I said, through Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or your traditional debit card. Um, and it, it's a closed loop system, the consumer. So when Montel, when you download kind pay and you add your credit card and you add a hundred dollars to that account, I want you to know that hundred dollars is being held in an FDIC insured bank account as well. So the, from a compliance standpoint, from a transparency standpoint, the money's never leaving the ecosystem. This is why the bank is comfortable with the risk because we know who the, dispensary owner is we know who our client is and we have we know <coughs> excuse me we know who the who the consumer is right because we have their information when they log in and join kind pay that we know everything about the transaction and the money sits in the same bank and is literally just crediting and debiting between montel and the bank right your hundred dollars goes and it's real time so when you spend your $9,500 at that dispensary, it's coming out of kind pay and going directly into that merchant's account. There is no end of day settlement. They don't have to wait for anything. It's all real time. 
Wow. Well, look, and I got, all FDIC insured. I got to take a little break just to pay some bills and make sure that money goes in our account. Let me take a little break and then I'll come back and let's talk a little bit more about this. We're here today with Lesby Blount Motto, Mr. David Denenberg, who is really revolutionizing the entire cannabis industry. And I'm telling you, uh, it's about time. And I'm glad that it's you that's getting it done, my friend. Let me take a break. We'll be back right after this. Well, welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And today's guest is a very, very, very special guest, person that I've been in, I've known now for multiple years. His name is Mr. David Denenberg. He's the founder and CEO of Kind Financial. It's an organization that's been established to see if it can take care of some of the pitfalls I would say, that have been involved in the cannabis industry now for many years, helping them to solve some of the financial issues and really bring this entire industry into this century. David, thank you so much for being here, sir. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So now you'll be announcing soon that uh, Kind Pay will be available across the country, right? Yes, sir. We're very excited for this. Absolutely. And then what has been, what has been the industry's reaction to you? You know, um, the retailers that we've spoken to, and quite frankly, some of the uh, local governments that we've spoken to have been incredibly receptive to it. It's, you know, the answer we get often is it's about time. And it's such a humbling comment to hear, you know, whether that customer ends up going with us for whatever reasons or not. Um, well, I mean, not I- many times. Yeah. I don't understand. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I don't understand why a customer would not go with you. I mean, to walk in a dispensary, you know, you got to go down the street to the to the ATM. You got to take out, you know, some large number of 20s. You got to carry large numbers of 20s in your pocket, get back up to this dispensary, give them that. And then you got extra money in your pocket. You don't have extra money in your pocket. It's just it's just been such a daunting task to always show up at a dispensary with cash. So I don't understand why any consumer wouldn't jump at the opportunity. I think the consumer, I think everyone's going to embrace it. Um, I'm trying to be humble in my conversation with you and not be overly excited or overly confident. Um, You know, this industry has seen, unfortunately, because of the barriers that we have because of the federal law versus the state law, we've seen a lot of gimmicks in this industry before. We've seen people taking credit cards, which, you know, quite frankly, is not a straight transparent transaction and shouldn't be taking place. We've seen people that have had, you know, the one window of the store you go and you buy a coupon with your credit card, and then you cash out at the other window with the coupon, right? So that's money laundering, that's fraud. But these are the kind of gimmicks that I call them have, that have taken place over the years in the industry because we haven't had these opportunities. So everyone says, this is a great product. I understand it, it makes total sense. But sometimes it takes a little bit longer to explain it to the, to the potential retailer just because. At the, and they eventually realize it. This really is something that they've all been waiting for. Absolutely. And again, okay, if you implement this in, in August, and what's the what has been the federal government's reaction to this? You know, um, I can't speak for the federal government. I can speak for my partners. And the way we feel about it is, it's a safe, secure, absolutely transparent transaction. We know both parties involved. Both parties have been validated, and we feel very comfortable with it. It's all about compliance. And, you know, to try to do something like this, Montel, on our own, per se, like if Kind went out and we, 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 we built Kind Pay app and we partnered with several different banks, let's all be honest with each other. The, the, the opportunity for loosey-goosey, for non-transparency would exist. But the fact that we are partners with one bank, the fact that we, the bank and us built the app together, it's a banking grade app. Um, we feel incredibly comfortable and the bank feels incredibly comfortable that we are doing this 100% above board, transparent, and the right way. We are not trying to facilitate any money laundering. Actually, we feel this will solve or help anti-money laundering or money laundering as far as bank you know, financial transactions are concerned for the exact reason that both the customer and the dispensary owner are our customers. There is no, there is no middle ground. There is no middle person. There is no third part, third party credit card processor. The bank is doing everything. And that should, should have you, have you gone down to testify before Congress to let them know what you're doing at least, or you're just, you're just doing this and making sure you stay compliant and they will look us up and take a look themselves. You know, we, we, we're talking to the right people. 
Uh, we have spoken to some people. You know, I, I get incredibly frustrated with Congress as a, you know, as a an American citizen and as a canvas and entrepreneur. Um, you know, the House has pushed several bills forward, including the Safe Banking Act, which they passed. And in my personal opinion, the Safe Banking Act is a public safety bill. Okay. Yes, it's a cannabis bill, but it's a public safety bill. And, you know, our friends in the Senate, and I don't mean to offend you, Montel, I know you're a Republican, but our friends in the Senate. I'm, I'm more of an independent, let me tell you. I know you are. <laughs> Things have evolved. Um, but I, you know, they don't even have a hearing on, it. you know, Mike, Mike Crapo, chairman of financial services, hasn't even had a meeting on the safe banking bill that the house passed. So look, at we've all been leaders. We've all been, there's thousands of entrepreneurs in this industry who have said, you know what, if you're not going to help us, we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to self-regulate. We're going to do the things we have to do so we don't get in trouble. We do things the right way. And you know. I'm sure we're going to be examined. I'm sure people are going to call and poke and prod. I welcome that, quite frankly. One, two, maybe this will prove if you give the industry banking, wow, look what could happen to it. Let's give it the chance it deserves. Absolutely. What's your, what's your prediction for the next year when it comes to this as a new, new component of the industry? From, a, from what standpoint? From a, vo- a revenue standpoint? From a... Well, Impact on the industry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's 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 take it from the impact on the industry. What is your what's your prediction for the next year? I would like to believe that this is going to be well adopted. Uh, you know, we are going to work tooth and nail to make sure it gets adopted. We want to work with everybody. We want to encourage adoption. Um, you know, there are so many pitfalls. All, you know, in the industry, Montel. But the reality of it is, the way we've always found it is, if you hit it straight on and tell the truth and you're honest with your customers and you're honest with the state regulators, you know, we do think this is going to be well embraced. We think that government's going to accept it. We think that this is going to provide cashless payments for tax collection. Um, It's going to the world we live in. I hate to be redundant, but with the COVID world we live in, with the public health issues we now live in, this is a necessity in this industry today. So we'll lead by example, I guess, is is, is the answer, you know, and I think there's a lot of other things that this all goes into which I care very much about, which talks about just reform in general. You know, we, from a political standpoint, the debates that we still talk about, are you for marijuana, are you against marijuana? It just makes any, the world we live in today, we need to move forward. I know we're all hurting and we're all scared and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But the reality of it is cannabis is here for the long haul. Okay. The industry is not going to go anywhere. And it's the old addition through subtraction, in my personal opinion, Montel, which is, if the federal government were to legalize cannabis, you know, not only is it going to be a huge tax generator, a huge job generator, but we're going to save $20 billion a year enforcing arcane racist drug laws. Um, and, and this has to be taken seriously. And now we're talking about police reform today and all these other issues. You know, how cannabis reform is not mandated is part of all of these other reforms because it touches it. It research cannabis touches it. Healthcare, cannabis touches it. Police reform, cannabis touches it. These are all social issues that need to be dealt with today. And I find it appalling that we don't take it more seriously. How's this been embraced in California? So far, so good. I mean, people are excited for this. We're talking to delivery companies today. I mean, this is, this is a home run for delivery companies, right? Customer goes online, they, they place their order, the order is fulfilled. The driver shows up. The, you know, you show each other your phones. That's how the transaction takes place. And everyone goes away. No one's touching anybody. No one has to reach in their pockets or exchange cash. It, delivery companies, this is going to be fabulous for. And the part of this that we're not talking about, and that's my fault, I apologize, but it's really the whole food chain. Even the growers, right, who are selling to either in California, to your point, to the distribution model, Or in other states, they're selling straight wholesale to either the manufacturers or to the dispensaries. That's a cash transaction. It doesn't have to be anymore. We're going to bank the grower who's going to sell to the wholesale market. So the opportunities I personally believe and the company believes for kind pay is endless. Are you thinking about rolling it out in one state first and then rolling it across the country? Or We are working with – sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. We are working with what I would call a couple – you know first to market partners that we're going to be entering the market with. So the short answer is yes. 
Okay. And you, you know, you're not ready to announce who they are yet. Not yet. Not today. Okay. We'll, you'll have me back and we'll talk about it later. Absolutely. We'll have you back. <laughs> and, and again, but, but again, the rollout will be not necessarily a slow rollout, but you're going to just test it in waters in different States first to make sure that it, 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 you know, you pass all the tests and then you'll continue to roll it out. Yeah. The reality of it is it's, it's technology and banking, right? So it's a, it's a very important product and, and to, for it to work and work properly with no issues. So we are targeting, you know, either multi-state operators or large operators in individual states to, you know, beta test this with per se. Okay. Now let's, 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 let's clear the page for just a second and talk about the industry in general. What do you think, where do you think the state of the cannabis industry in the country is today? I mean, we know that there are going to be several new states that are going to have initiatives on the ballot in 2020 and uh, several more in 2022, 24. So we're right now sitting, I think, as I, you know, I've kind of lost count, but I think we're at 37 states in the District of Columbia. And, you know, at the end of this election cycle, we could be at 40 states in the District of Columbia. So that's like, you know, less than 10 states, less than 20 percent of the country that's not covered. What do you think, the, the just in general, what, what do you think of the landscape of cannabis in America? I think the industry has gone from a billion dollar industry to a $15 billion industry over the last eight years. We've had states upon state come on board. I think that what we're seeing today is more of, it's become more corporate, I guess, if I'm trying to say Montel, which is the industry has slowly grown up. I would say over the last couple of years, really being the, ca- the catalyst of the exponential growth in the corporate you know, material part of this came from Canada. Right. Once Canada federally legalized marijuana, you saw a lot of American companies going up there and doing reverse takeovers and going public up there, which, you know, made this a a more corporate industry and a very large industry. You're seeing the big players coming from using their securities in Canada now and coming into the U.S. and buying up companies. So it is becoming much more corporate. Um, But I always go back to Every entrepreneur starts a company, whatever our dreams are, our dreams are. Whether you want to build the biggest and best and you want to sell it, whether you want to build the biggest and best and keep it generationally, or you want to have a nice small company and it's going to be your family business. There's nothing wrong with any answer, but the opportunities of the exit as entrepreneurs now exists. We have, we see some companies listing on the NASDAQ now, right? And that's exciting. Uh, but I always go back to until the federal government legalizes marijuana and you can have interstate commerce right where and, and get rid of this whole licensing model that that you know people like on the product side have to live with if you create a brand in california and you want to open it up in new york you either have to find someone to partner with there and license your name and brand and formulas there or you have to move there and operate right you can't ship your product from california to new york so until interstate commerce happens until true banking comes and until 280 is fixed. It's not fair for re- for retail cannabis operators to be paying basically a 60% effective tax rate on their retail stores because they're deemed as drug dealers and can't write off inventory. So until the top level things happen, we're never going to see what the growth that this industry is going to go through. But I think we're on solid ground. I mean, I think that if you look back at the Obama administration, and now we're in this in the Trump administration, and I'm talking about cannabis right now only, right? Other than the first couple months when Jeff Sessions rescinded the coal memo, um, I think it stayed the same, if not grown. Uh, and if it wasn't for COVID, I do believe we'd have more states right now talking about ballot initiatives and and more legislation. Well, you know, now how do you impact the hemp industry? Mitch McConnell's best friend, right? He legalized hemp and won't even talk about cannabis. But that being said, um, if you're talking about kind, everything that we do for kind absolutely positively works for hemp, CBD, in both of those industries. But in in those industries, you still have to have a seed to patient, you know, tracking system. And so are you working now within the hemp hemp world? Absolutely. We're going to, we are working with CBD companies right now. Absolutely. We're working with one of the largest CBD companies right now. Uh, That's hopefully going to be one of our launch partners. And on the hemp side, absolutely. You're still growing a a plant and you still need to track it and follow it and and all that kind of stuff. So yes, we are, we see those as opportunities. Now, just the other day, the federal government, FinCEN actually, right? They came out with additional guidance on hemp to make it easier for them to bank, but they still have the same problems because bankers don't understand it necessarily. They still see it as a marijuana plant 
and it's too dangerous to, to, to get involved with. So we are here for the plant, right? Whether that's cannabis, CBD, hemp, whatever it is, we're here. Gotcha. And then now, again, right now, so is that going to be a rollout at the same time? No, I, no, we're, we're, we are focused right now on plant touching dispensaries and trying to normalize the retail experience in the cannabis stores, as well as the public safety issues and public health issues that we've spoken about. I, I, I think that right now is the most critical thing for our industry. However, in saying that, yes, we are going to create sales for CBD and hemp as well and target some of those industries as well, but they will be secondary. And in, right, right now you do have CBD being sold in gas stations being sold in, you know, some CVSs sure, and places sure. across the country, and then they can take, they can sell that with a credit card anyway, just as a normal Correct. purchase. Correct. Right? Yes. Okay, so good. All right. So good, good, good. Well, what else, well, I mean, <laughs> what else do you want to add? We can talk about anything. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, we live in a great time right now. Cannabis specific again. <laughs> you know, we, we have a great opportunity for all of us today. Um, you know, I, get, I speak to all kinds of people all the time and they always ask me that I, that I miss it, you know, am I too late? And I just want to encourage everybody, this is still the ground floor of this industry. We still have a long way to go. Um, you know, join the fight on the advocacy side for, for legalization and, you know, start a business and support yourself and support your family. Absolutely. And if anybody want to get any more information, where would they go? Kind.com? How did they get information? Kind.financial. Look us up. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on so we're on all the social medias. Make sure you come back to us when you're ready to announce with the launch. And so we can get that up here on Let's Be Bought My Tone and give people information about where they need to go and how they need to go about getting involved and making sure they have access to kind services themselves so they can actually utilize it. And we'll blow this up all over the country for you, okay? I look forward to that opportunity. Absolutely, my friend. Well, thank you so much for being here today with us on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Make sure you tune in to the next edition of Let's Be Blunt.